So this interview coming up is from a very interesting guy called Vince Eager. Obviously not his original name. But he was in that stable of stars by Larry Parnes. And of course the first day the Beatles ever appeared as a rock and roll group, the Silver Beatles, was on the 10th of May 1960 when they were auditioning to be a backing band for Billy Fury, one of Larry Parnes' big, big stars. Tell us about Billy. Oh yeah, how long he got? But Billy, to me, actually, Billy was another Eddie. You know, they were very similar in temperament, very quiet, loving guys, um, but a spark of mischief, you know, <laughs> both of them had. And um, Billy, I was doing this tour with Marty Wilde and John Barry Seven, and we, uh, we were playing the uh, Soldo at Bergenhead. And it was October 59, I think. It must have been or 58. And uh, I did my sound check and I was hungry. So I asked one of the stagehands where I could get a bite to eat. So now I said, go out for a wimpy. And he told me how to get there. And there was some spare land at the back of the cinema because of the bombing that had gone on during the war. It was still barren, you know, it was like, these bombs are dropped all around the cinema, the, you know, and it still stood. <laughs> so I, I said, okay. So I go out the dressing room door, four o'clock at the stage door, walk across this barren land. It's drizzling. It's misty, horrible October day. And uh, this guy with a hat on uh, sort of, excuse me. I said, yeah. He said, is Mr. Parnes in? I said, why do you ask? He said, well, I've, sent, I've written some songs and I've sent them to him, but I haven't heard back. I said, when did you send them? He said, well, I've sent them twice. And I said, oh, really? He said, okay. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go and... I don't, I don't know why it is, but normally I wouldn't do this. But I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go back in. I said, I'll ask Mr. Parnes. And I don't know why I did it. Normally I'd say, well, he's busy. He's like... <laughs> So I said, oh, so I went in, and the cinemas, like a soldo cinemas, because there were cinemas, they didn't have dressing rooms like they did in the theatres. Yeah. So probably two or three dressing rooms, if you were lucky. Well, Marty and I would share it. And uh, I went in, and Larry's there. And it was unusual because Larry didn't really travel further north than what for Gap because he just didn't like leaving London. So I told him the story. The guy outside is a songwriter, blah, blah, blah. So I said, Oh, fetch him in, flip him, you know, fetch him. <laughs> I fetched Billy in, and so there's Marty, Larry, Billy, and I. And uh, Larry said to Billy, uh, So what do you do? He said, I'm a songwriter. Now, in those days, he didn't get singer songwriters. No. And I don't think even Marty had written at that stage, but he turned out to be a prolific writer. Mm. But for him to say, I'm a songwriter, and cool, I mean, he was a good looking guy. But yeah. like, said, oh, don't you sing? He said, Well, I, I do sing. He said, Just for trying my songs out with my girlfriend. And he said, Well, let's hear a song then. So he played Maybe Tomorrow. And the, it only got a few bars into it, way going. <laughs> uh, and he, at the end of it, we applauded it. And that, you don't get that, you know. Yeah. Um, and I said, that was wonderful. He said, you're a songwriter. He said, yeah. He said, well, don't you sing? He said, not much. He said, really? He said, have you got anything else? He said, yeah. So he then played Margot Don't Go. And when he finished it, applause again from the three of us. And uh, Larry said, how would you like to go on tonight? <laughs> and Billy said, I'm, I'm on stage. He said, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Oh, good. Well, we'll get you a guitar and you can go on and you can sing a couple of songs. So he did. And he was introduced. And do you know who introduced him? Go on. Jimmy Tarbuck. Who was, oh, all, was 
He was also auditioning for Larry. <laughs> he was auditioning for Larry, and he introduced, but it wasn't Billy Fury, it was Ronnie Witcherly. Yeah. His real name. So Larry said, I want to sign you up. Right. Here's a, and then he paid for his taxi home, told your parents you could join in us. You do the last night at uh, Str Soldo Stretford tomorrow, then you'll fly to London and you'll move in with Vince and me and all this. And uh, that's how we got to meet him. Then we, uh, <clears throat> he did the following night and absolutely bummed them. The audience absolutely loved him. And the next thing is, uh, we're traveling down and he, he, he's never flown before. And he, he, I sit next to him. And I'm at the window because he didn't want to be near the window. So all of a sudden he started to eat, sick back. So it wasn't a very good fl flight for him. And we got back and Larry's chauffeur was there, took us all back to Larry's. And uh, Billy and I became flatmates. And it was the, uh, it was the craziest period of my tenure with, with Barnes because the mischief that he got up to was unbelievable. Mischievous, but he really, he was a mischievous. I mean, Larry had a marble table and it was quite big and he paid £500 for it. This was 1958. Wow. His whole flat was done out like a Hollywood movie set. And uh, within weeks, Billy was anticipating the table being great to do scale electric on. And kept saying, we've got to get scale electric kit. Well, before the scale electric kit, he started buying air fixed aeroplanes. And he would go on to Larry's balcony and he'd set fire to them and he'd throw them into Gloucester Road, sometimes trying to land them on the top of double decker buses because it was. <laughs> The penthouse suite, top floor. And uh, so I, we told him it might be a good idea to stop doing that. Could have been trouble. <laughs> and then there was, what was the other one? We had the scale lake street, the planes. Oh, then when we were doing, uh, we were doing summer season at Yarmouth on the pier, to get to the theatre at the end of the pier, you had to go through the fun fair bit. You know, there was a couple of rides, but lots of rifles. There's a rifle. Oh, yeah. So one night, early season, Yarmouth, we go and say, oh, let's have a go on the rifles. So it became a bit of a habit. And all the kids would be around, you know, the, because he'd had a hit then with Paranormal. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's firing the, the rifle, and seriously, he loved it. So when the season finished, we went back to the flat, and he bought himself an air rifle. <laughs> Larry's flat used to have a long corridor off the lounge. The lounge was, there was a long corridor, and on the right were three bedrooms. At the end was a bedroom, and on the left was the kitchen and the bathroom. It's a big flat. And one day, I was supposed to be going somewhere, and I go to open the door, and I hear this ping. <laughs> And there was Billy. <laughs> that just scared me as it came out. And he held me in there for about 20 minutes. <laughs> I had to go to a meeting. And, you know, it was, we were good mates. He had some good fun. But he was a mischievous so He yeah. really was. And then, of course, he, he got his dog. We have the dog there as well. He loved his animals, didn't he? These airfix planes, I've got a photo of him. Surrounded by his air fixed planes. And the strangest thing, not the strangest, but what was really funny, I guess it would be 30 years later, he died, didn't it? 35 years later. Uh, they made a documentary, which I featured in quite heavily, on Billy. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we're just messing around and doing stuff. And, uh, I went to this meeting. Well, it was a launch, a launch party for the DVD that made about Billy's life. And I was there, and his mum and his brother Albie were there also. He was in London, 
And I'd met his mum a couple of times. She was a great character. Mm. Lovely lady, Jean. And uh, we get talking. And of course, Billy's been gone quite a while now. And I said to Jean, I said, you know what your son used to do? She said, what? I said, he used to throw planes off Larry's balcony, set fire to them, throw them off, and try and land them on buses. She said, oh, really? She said, that's funny, because when he was a kid of 14, 12, 14, we lived in the Dingle, and there was a backyard. And in the backyard was a little toilet and also a coal house. He said, and Billy had the back bedroom, the little bedroom, like the box room. And he used to make planes then and set fire to them, try to land them on the toilets or on the the, the, uh, the coal house. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, they still did it. And that's uh, what you call affluence, isn't it? They used to do it in a paper plane, and then it becomes a big brick and stuff. It does the same thing with uh, scale electric or whatever it is. Air fix, air fix planes. Yeah. yeah. Great car. Love it. Well, my uh, late mother in law um, actually knew him when he he was Ronnie in, in the Dingle, yeah. Really? Yeah. And his, uh, his mum was a lovely lady. Well, she ended up, um, well, I, I live in, in Mosty Hill. She used to live not far from me, about five minutes away. Right. She'd of, often see her around. She, she was a super lady. Yeah. yeah. She developed a few hangers on towards the end, particularly after Billy had died. There's a lot of people said they were, you know, looking after her, but really some of them were looking after their, their own interests. You know, to get, to see, I won't mention it. And you know, there's one in particular, and I just felt I, I felt like you know having a go, but sleeping dogs lie. I thought, but uh, yeah, yeah, he, it's he, a, he's a wonderful character, Billy. Yeah, he had some good friends. He, you, do you ever meet Hal Carter? No, Hal Carter was a scouser, and I would have trusted Hal with my life. He, and he, he became Eddie Cochran's uh, road manager. And uh, he looked after Eddie, as Eddie should have been looked after. Occasionally, you know, Eddie would get away with something, or <sighs> Hal wouldn't let him do it. But Hal was a wonderful guy, and really so loved in the business. You know, by Marty and Billy, and myself, and Alvin Stardust. He, 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 yeah, he was a great guy, was Hal. Great guy. Yeah. Uh, and Billy, I, I was watching a documentary recently, and they were talking about um, Billy's first album, "The Sound of Fury," and sort of really uh, almost as Britain's first proper rock and roll album. Oh yeah, that was amazing. That album, and he made it without Pond's knowing, and Jack Good produced it. How did it? Oh, I didn't know that. No, I didn't know. That's why he, Billy used the name. Uh, William Wilberforce, because he didn't want Larry to know he'd done it. Right. Yeah, and that's how I did it. And uh, yeah, he, he was. I mean, he really was a smart lad, but he, a few years in the business, you know, he you got smarter. He got to read people. Uh, yeah. But that was a great album. Yeah, it's a fabulous album. Even the most sort of knowledgeable rock and rollers you know you see still say it's the best 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 british rock and roll album ever made yeah fabulous album of course half the tracks are mentioned as being written by william wilberforce because in that way he didn't have to pay larry yeah larry wouldn't get the royalties smart it was a, really was a I don't know how to say it, really. He was such a humble lad. He had this little, little, little boy mischievous <laughs> laying in his body, but every so often he'd do something that you, you wouldn't have thought it was Billy Fury. It was so childish in a way. Yeah. You know, not, not anything to hurt anybody or upset anybody, but he, he, he was a mischievous. Little son, when he wanted to be. 
<laughs> so of course the final thing is uh you're coming to liverpool looking very forward. very soon 30th of november liverpool empire will you be there i will be there good oh yes we've already done it once in nottingham and uh that was a tremendous success so i'm looking forward i'm doing a bit more i think in liverpool than i did good. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's a great show. It's very well, very well done. Technical. I mean, uh, I've only worked with a Philharmonic Orchestra on a couple of occasions. So to do that is, is, is a real, even at my age, it's a real pleasure. <laughs> you know, a real pleasure. And I yeah. do sit down and like some of the tales I mentioned to you earlier, I do those with, uh, we've got a screen and, um, I put a friend of mine who used to be the head of the British Cartoon Association. Very clever guy, and he's done me loads of uh, cartoons. And Billy wow. was such like, and Billy was, he deserves cartoons because he was a car cartoon character at times. Some of the, <laughs> like the stories with the flying the plane and, you know, with the air rifle and other stuff. Yeah. He used that. Yeah. Uh, a great tribute to Billy. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Good. So, uh, Come and say hello. Oh, I, I will do, definitely. I'll hang around the uh, the stage door waiting for my autograph in the audition. 